Okay guys, the wait is finally over. No longer do you have to watch the same video over and over again to get your little starship fix. Instead, you can have one of your own and let me show you how. I've partnered with a 3D modeling company, which as you can see, makes some really good models of the Starship, which you can place on your mantle or on your bookshelves here, plus a Crew Dragon 3D model as well. Here's the components for you, very nice, as well as the components assembled in this version here. But before we move on to exactly how you get it, we have something else to commemorate as well. We have hit and surpassed over 3,000 subscribers on this channel, and I really want to express my appreciation for that as well. You guys are the best subscribers in the universe, and so to commemorate that, I am going to roll out a rather grim series about how our civilization and our species could meet its end. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do because that's how I do things on this channel. But we need to understand why our species needs to become a multi-planetary civilization and why Elon Musk is pushing so hard. But, but to hell with that, let's talk about the Starship and the Crew Dragon first. Welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. Let's get right to it, the thing that I'm sure you guys are the most concerned about. How do I get my own starship? How do I get my own crew dragon? Well, there's a company called Spaceship Mania that's become my first sponsor because I want to try to make a career out of doing what I do. I didn't think that I would be trying this this early, but I've got over 3,000 subscribers in less than six months. And I can only explain that by saying that I have the best subscribers in the universe. I can't explain it any other way that we've grown this quickly. So in any event, thank you so much. But make sure that you use the code ANGRY10. I have it here and I also have it in the description. And that will give you a 10% discount and also you'll help me out in terms of trying to make a living out of making these wonderful videos because I'm having more fun than anybody has a right to and you folks have just been so enthusiastic in your support I really want to try to give this a shot. There'll be more changes coming to this channel soon giving you guys more benefits and perks and opportunities as time goes on. But all of that having been said, get your own starship Get your own crew dragon and don't wait. I'm eager to see what happens here in the next few days. So, let's move on to the topic at hand, shall we? You know, I think a lot of people are wondering, why is Elon Musk in such a hurry to make us a multi-planetary civilization? Why is he pushing so hard to make the Starship operational? I mean, he's blown up four prototypes already Shouldn't he be moving at a slower pace and being a little bit more cautious? Or is there really a reason for us to be in such a hurry? Well, when Elon talks about threats to human civilization, he talks about asteroids, he talks about the sun eventually becoming so hot that it renders this planet uninhabitable, but those are threats that are so remote as to being beyond our consideration. Are there other threats that he's not talking about? Well, as a matter of fact, there are. There are a number of extremely tangible threats to human civilization and to our very existence that makes us becoming a multi-planetary civilization an absolute essential. And that's what this series is going to be covering. 
So let's get started with the most clear and obvious danger to human civilization. And that, of course, is nuclear war. Now, since the fall of the Soviet Union, the general idea has been that the chances of a massive nuclear exchange between the two major powers has dropped tremendously. But that just isn't the case. If anything, it may have gone up recently. I mean, look at the size of the nuclear arsenals that both the United States and Russia has at their disposal. It has gone down quite a bit since the Cold War, but still it's an unfathomable amount of nuclear ordnance. And as you can see from this more recent graph, the Russians have added nearly a thousand more nuclear warheads to their arsenal and all 2,000 of those are deployed and ready to go. And yet what has me even more concerned are developments like this. Since the U.S. made the questionable decision to drop out of the ABM treaty, the Russians predictably came up with a new generation of ICBMs that are hypersonic and also capable of avoiding anti-ballistic missile systems, as demonstrated by this video. Now, it's hotly contested as to what the actual capabilities of these weapons are, but it has a lot of strategic analysts extremely worried. These new missiles are not designed just to follow a set path, but rather to bypass weapon defense systems, as you can see there, and make their way through a circuitous route towards their targets. Now, Vladimir Putin recently put one of these missile systems on display to a very enthusiastic crowd, claiming that it was capable of achieving speeds over 20 times that of the speed of sound, far in excess of any ICBM that had been used in the past, capable of evading anti-missile defense systems and also de delivering a potential first strike with a terrifying amount of speed. And once the missile's first stage dropped away, the second stage would be able to deploy multiple warheads to its target, or MIRVs, which had been used for quite some time. And did you see the target just there? It was the state of Florida. And Putin actually was quoted as saying that it was capable of destroying an area the size of Texas. And yes, he did use that particular example. So let's just take a hypothetical situation where Russia decides to utilize only 25% of their nuclear arsenal on the United States, or 10 warheads per state, and apply it to my home state of Colorado. Since Colorado Springs is such a strategic pressure point, we'll go ahead and reserve three warheads for that particular target. Now, due to its size, we'll go ahead and put two more warheads over the city of Denver. And now we use our fifth warhead to take out the last large remaining city on the front range, which is Pueblo. And if you wanted to be thorough, you could also take out Fort Collins and moving west to Grand Junction thus destroying every major city in Colorado and still having three warheads left over for good measure. And keep in mind, this scenario assumes that the Russians only use 25% of the bombs that they currently have readily available to strike against the United States. They have 4,000 additional stockpiled, which they would certainly get ready in the tensions before a major nuclear exchange. They have more than enough to completely destroy the United States and all of its allies, and the U.S. could do the same to Russia and China. But of course, as most of us know, the hell would not end there. According to a paper in the Journal of Geophysical Research, linked in the description, the winter lasting after a full nuclear exchange, or even a relatively small one, could last as long as 10 years. 10 years of winter that would wreak absolute havoc upon our planet. The reason for this is, is the soot created by burning cities and the nuclear explosions associated with them. 
lasts a much longer time in the atmosphere than volcanic eruptions, for example. Consequently, the longer the soot stays in the atmosphere, the longer the sun is blocked, and the worse the impact on the climate and our crops, and mass starvation across the planet would doubtlessly follow. Such a thing would drive our species to the very edge of extinction, and while it has been argued that Mars would be a far worse environment no matter what we do to our planet with a nuclear war, that argument falls flat when you consider that the survivors of a nuclear war would be desperately killing one another for the few remaining supplies, as opposed to a Martian colonization who would be united in purpose in their effort to survive. No, there's little question that nuclear war would almost certainly bring about the end of our species or at least drive our civilization back by many hundreds if not thousands of years. But what about the concept of mad or mutual assured destruction? Does not the nightmarish characteristics of this kind of scenario not prevent us from doing this sort of thing? Doesn't it make it impossible for something like this to happen, given the consequences? Well, during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Soviet Foxtrot-class diesel submarine like this one was forced beneath the surface by an American task force which used training depth charges in order to threaten it. However, there was no way for the crew or the officers to know exactly what sort of ordnance was being used against it. As a result, they had to make a decision as to whether or not to use their nuclear torpedo Pedo, a 10 kiloton tactical nuclear device against the task force that was going after them. Cut off from Moscow and under relentless bombardment, both the captain and the political commissar on board decided to launch their torpedo, which had a warhead nearly as powerful as that which destroyed Hiroshima. Such a weapon no doubt would have started World War III unless we had shown considerable restraint. But because of this guy, Vasily Arkhipov, who was the commander of the submarine fleet and by merest chance happened to be on board. He recognized the training depth charges for what they were and overrode their decision. It is humbling to think that both I, my children, and probably billions of others owe our lives to the decision and cool-headedness of this one Soviet officer back in the early 1960s. This was by no means the only close call we've ever had. In 1995, Boris Yeltsin became the first world leader to activate his nuclear briefcase when a launch was detected from Norway, which was thought to be the beginnings of a nuclear strike. It turned out to be a rocket launched to simply study the northern lights, but the Russian radar operators didn't know that, and once again, nuclear conflict was narrowly avoided. And the list goes on. All you have to do is Google list of nuclear close calls and you'll find a list of incidents that will keep you up at night. No, it's very clear that it hasn't been a philosophy of mutual assured destruction or anything along those lines that have kept our civilization from destroying itself, but simple dumb luck. So, short of a global nuclear disarmament, which all of us know I think is highly unlikely, the only way to protect our species from utter destruction at the hands of our own nuclear weapons is to relocate to another planet and make ourselves into a multi-planetary civilization as Elon Musk has urged for some time now. But why Mars? Why would Mars be so secure? Well, first of all, a station in Earth orbit would just be far too vulnerable to nuclear attack from Earth's surface, and even the moon would be vulnerable. It's far easier to get a warhead to the moon that has no intention of coming back than it is to land a human on the surface. 
On the other hand, Mars is an entirely different story. As you can see, and as most of us know, the close approach where there's any kind of realistic chance of getting a rocket or a warhead only comes up once every two years. So, you would have to plan your attack very precisely, and even then it would take around five or six months for a warhead to reach its target. Plenty of time for the Martian colony to do something about it. For example, launch a starship, parallel the course of the missile, and just throw some debris in the path of it. It would be very difficult to avoid something like that. No, if Elon Musk is looking to protect the human species from cataclysms like nuclear conflict, this is our perfect haven, and it may explain why he is so intent on reaching it. And in our subsequent episodes of this series, we will examine other cataclysms in detail as well, and perhaps his plans may come into sharper focus. You know, I grew up in a town called Colorado Springs, which, as many of you know, is home to NORAD, which of course controls America's strategic air defenses. And on top of that, we also had Peterson Air Force Base, Fort Carson, a major army base that is, and the Air Force Academy. And we knew for a fact that there were multiple Soviet missiles targeted on our city, that we had absolutely no chance of any kind of survival if and when a nuclear war occurred. And so we brashly said amongst ourselves as teenagers that we would just get up on the roof, put on a thick pair of sunglasses as if that was going to do any good, and watch the show. We felt that nuclear war was completely unavoidable. Well, the Soviet Union fell, and the bombs never fell. And, of course, that's a really good thing, but I don't want to leave any of you folks with the impression that nuclear war is inevitable, nor do I want to leave the impression that the danger has gone away because the Soviet Union is gone. Russia is more than capable, as I described in the video, of completely annihilating the United States and all of its allies and starting a nuclear winter that would drive our species to the edge of extinction, if not completely exterminating us entirely. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. And it's just one of a number of clear and tangible dangers that exist to our civilization that demands that we become a multi-planetary civilization if we are to survive. And I believe that's why Elon Musk is pushing so hard, frantically in fact, to get the Starship functional so that we can relocate to Mars as many of us as possible in order to ensure the survival of the species. And so that's why I started this series, to run down the list of things that could happen, not will, but could happen to our civilization that could lead to our extinction. In order to demonstrate to you that it's not just about an asteroid, it's not just about the sun eventually making this planet uninhabitable, something that's going to happen millions of years from now. No, it's, it's far more immediate than that. So, let's get through these episodes, and uh, I'm interested to hear your replies and your opinions about all of them, and let's also get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of it all. I can't believe how far I've already gotten, and I'm extremely grateful. And finally, don't forget about your own Starship and your own Crew Dragon and the discounts you can receive. I really, really would like to make this my career, and I'm very, very excited to see how many of you folks decide to jump on this opportunity, because these are really awesome products. So until next time, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>